The following program is a paid presentation for American Medicine Today. The information and opinions expressed are solely those of American Medicine Today and are not the opinions of the station, its affiliates, management, or employees. Coming up on American Medicine Today, we speak with a physicist and electrical engineer who is making breakthroughs in the next generation of cancer treatment using nanotechnology. Then we catch up with Ocala resident Don Sparkman and learn how the Bonatti spine procedures brought him back to enjoying the things he loves most. Finally, Dr. Bonatti discusses spine fusions. What are they and what do you need to know before undergoing this intense surgery? Find out coming up on American Medicine Today. Featuring cutting edge science and medical innovations, touching personal stories of recovery from pain, and political issues plaguing our healthcare. This is American Medicine Today. Brought to you by the Bonatti Spine Institute and Alfred Bonatti, MD. Thank you for joining us on American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Brumell, joined by Ethan Euchre. Happy to be here. Jeff Wagstaff. Thank you for having me, Kimberly. Absolutely. And world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Alfred Bonatti. Hello. Cancer continues to be one of mankind's deadliest killers. And joining us right now is Dr. Sakrat Kizrorev an electrical engineer and physicist who is working on a cancer treatment using nanotechnology. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Now, this is a pretty complex, complicated topic, um, yes. but you have said, I read an article, that the scientific community is finally realizing that the way we treat cancer is not optimal. So tell us what you mean by that before we get into the science. Traditionally, cancer has been treated, you know, surgery. Then they uh, applied chemotherapy, radiotherapy. Usually, they rely on certain antibody matching mm -hmm. to find the cancer cells in the body. And the traditional approaches, because of it, are very, no, they lack specificity. So, it means uh, therapy kills cancer cells and also kills normal cells. That's a big problem. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why chemotherapy is limited. It works first time, second time, but after that, it doesn't really work much. And chemotherapy cannot be used very efficiently because uh, of the uh, collateral damage. Healthy normal cells surrounding uh, cancer uh, tumor uh, sites also uh, are killed. Uh, the approach uh, we're using right now, if, eventually it will happen for sure. It's a more fundamental. We try to distinguish cancer cells from all the normal cells by the electric properties uh, at the molecular level. So we, we're got, going deeper in understanding how cancer is different from norm, normal cells. That's a future approach. Eventually it will happen. And we, some of the, I would say, pioneers in this field. Doctor, a very layman question. Yes. I read in the research that we've been treating cancer the same way for 20, 30 years. As I yes. sit here talking to you, I have my phone in front of me. And while yeah. we were talking, I couldn't help but think, 25 years ago, this phone would have been in a briefcase that you carried around. It was very expensive, and very people, very few people had access to it. In the size of a brick. Yeah. yeah. Today, mm -hmm. my phone is more powerful than the computer that Bill Clinton used when he was the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. How could we have that kind of technology advancements, yet still treat something this complex that's so prevalent in so many people's lives, the same way we did 25 years ago. It mm -hmm. just doesn't make sense. It's a, but you cannot compare the field of medicine to the field of electronics, consumer electronics. You know, uh, in fact, I joined medical world about seven years ago. Before that, I worked in the computer industry. That's a very interesting question you just asked. And the way computers have been developed, every second year they multiply uh, aerial densities, data rates, and so on. There is no problem with making errors. Uh, you know, I'm sure you heard of beta versions. There are always first versions which malfunction in most cases. With treatment of humans, you cannot do that. You, you have to develop, that's, that's a big key difference. You have to develop therapy which functions the first time you apply it. Ideally, that's what you want. You, you cannot really risk lives of people like you risk. Uh, we're developing computers, cell phones. There are 10 generations of devices which don't work before eventually they come up with something that works. With treating humans, of course, you cannot do that. As a result, we have millions of different protocols. To follow that, that that slows things down sure. and i'll give you one example of very successful therapy called immunotherapy cancer yes. therapy i'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure you've heard of yes. it mm -hmm. We've spoken it's, to been, it's been developed at least a decade ago 
the concept uh, came up. Maybe two decades ago, the concept uh, was first born, but it took quite a few years for the concept to be implemented because mm-hmm. of many tests you need to be done and so on. You have to follow protocol. That's the cost of being careful. Now, doctor, it's a very complex topic of what you yes. do with your nanotechnology, and we're up. We're going to be up against the break in just a couple of minutes. So, if you can break down for us what your research is and how it works. The, the way we treat cancer today relies on biology. Uh-huh. Biology is a very important field. So, what it, it implies, but biology is a, it's a very important fundamental field, but it's not sufficient to really to treat cancer. Uh, besides biology. There are other fields which are very important, chemistry, physics. Uh, traditionally, these two fields, especially physics and chemistry, have been somehow neglected in medicine mm-hmm. because of the difficult. And the, the nanoengineering is a field which the idea of nanoengineering, nanotechnology, is to explore efficiently, explore physics and chemistry. What it means to uh, to understand how cells interact at the molecular, at the atomic level, and to be able to control them, to distinguish cancer cells from normal cells. So that knowledge has not been there. So that's what we're trying to bring in. The game right now. I have to ask the nanotechnology yes. goes in, it identifies the cancer cells. When you disperse the nanotechnology, what does it do? Does it envelop them and destroy them? How How is it actually ridding the cancer cells? It delivers yes. drugs to those cells. Straight to them. That, and You're absolutely correct. Uh, in okay. fact, nanotechnology is more than that. You know, it's a, a delivery vehicle is one way to do that. It's probably the most popular way today to do it. Another way, more advanced way, a next generation nanotechnology is nanoparticles can be programmed. They, they're like little machines, you can say that. They're about okay. 30 nanometer in diameter. You know, 30 nanometers is 2,000 times thinner than the average human hair. So they go any way they, they want to go. But the idea of nanotechnology is to be able to control this nanomachine very precisely. And these machines can, if they can get inside the cancer cells, they themselves can kill cancer cells without even using a drug. Mm-hmm. That, of course, makes things much easier. You know, the drug is a very important field, but the drug has toxicity. And every time you deal with a drug, with any chemistry, mm-hmm. you have collateral damage. Nanotechnology, what it does, pretty much ideally, it eliminates any side effect. It just kills cancer cells and nothing else. Doctor, how you how you direct the nanofilament to the cell? We program of nanop- nanoparticles, they intra- administrated intravenously. So they go all over the body, through blood, through lymph, and like little antennas, they c- can pick up electric fields coming from cancer cells, which are very different from the electric fields coming from normal cells. That's how they know. It's pretty much very, very fundamental signature, you can say, of cancer cells. And when they pick up that information, they go there. Because they are so small, they can catch the cancer, you can say, at a single cell level. That's what we're aiming for, of course. Okay. You You're yeah. talking about animal studies now. How long before human trials? Animal mm-hmm. studies, we've finished on mice. Okay. Now we're working together with many hospitals and cancer centers, including Morfitt Cancer Institute in Tampa. First animal studies were done on ovarian cancer. And now with other uh, cancer uh, research groups, we're working on different cancers, prostate cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, breast mm-hmm. cancer, and others. Uh, also doing on different uh, species, on different animals. We expect within two years we can get to human two preclinical years. trials. Okay, thank Perfect. you so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Dr. Sakrat Kizrov an electrical engineer and physicist who is working on a cancer treatment using nanotechnology. Thank you so much um, for your innovative work. Very in interesting research. stuff, yes. doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank Bye-bye. you. And it's even cooler that there's yes. Moffitt right, right here, here in our backyard. I didn't even know that when I set up this interview. <laughs> it's almost sci fi. Moffitt, we're is. calling you next. Very cool. <laughs> Make sure you stay tuned because coming up after the break, our Back to Life segment. Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Bonatti created, perfected, and patented the Bonatti Spine Procedures. Using his genius, Bonatti invented the precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect 98.75% patient satisfaction. 55,000 procedures have been performed exclusively at our two locations. Over half our patients have suffered from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. Donald Sparkman is an extraordinary entrepreneur. I've been a a self-made man. I've never worked for anybody at all. My whole entire life, I've always been self-employed. Never had a paycheck. Worked most of my life moving houses and barbering. And moving houses is a really tough business, crawling underneath houses and jacking them up and putting them on trailers and moving them across town. I'd work in the barbershop during the day and 
after the barbershop, I'd work on moving houses. But a slip and fall changed everything for Don. About one year before I went to the Institute, I was at one of my rental houses and it had about seven stairs going up it and there was mildew on it and I fell down the mildew stairs and hit my lower back on each rung of the stairs. And at that time I did the, the natural thing that comes to most guys is just did that dance, you know, you do when you get hurt. Oh my God, oh my God. A couple of days later I couldn't walk. So I did the Bengay thing and the Icy Hot and the cold packs and it just didn't get any better. His pain intensified so much that he was no longer able to function at his normal 110%. The pain on my body was in my lower back. Um, I had found out that I had ruptured several discs. It, it hurt so bad that I could hardly, hardly walk and it, it was just pain of needles going down my uh, right leg and sometimes my left leg. It got to where my days at the barbershop were shorter and shorter until the time that I had to start walking on a cane. I went to my general practitioner and that's when he took the x-rays and told me that I had several ruptured discs. The thing that I wanted to do first is go to a chiropractor, see if he could help me with those disc problems. He did nothing but hurt me. It's the worst thing anybody can do is go to a chiropractor with lower back problems. It put me down to where I could hardly walk and then he wanted to schedule another session with me. That didn't happen. I tried all the topical creams and uh, also took uh, several of the shots in the spine from a pain management doctor. They started giving me pain medicines that made my stomach sick. Then I started refusing them. After actually feeling worse by going to the pain management, I, my memory was foggy. Uh, I couldn't do the things I wanted to do anymore. When conservative treatments left Don in even more pain and the medications began affecting other parts of his overall health, he knew that he had to take matters into his own hands and contacted the Bonatti Spine Institute. It was on the TV that I heard about the Institute. Then I did my research and I had read on the internet how he had helped others and seen others that had similar back issues like mine. And I contacted my local attorney that I work with and he says, you know, anybody that's real successful in doing something, there's always somebody there to write something bad about them. And the good outweighed the bad. It wasn't hard to make my decision after reading the testimonies on the internet. So that's when I decided to go to Hudson and do what I had to do. When I first contacted the Institute, uh, we went through the norm as the insurances and things like that. I went down there and they, they redid an MRI, and, which was a, made me feel good because it didn't take anybody else's opinion. They, they made their own opinion up. I did talk to a surgeon and he explained everything to me, he explained to me how the operation was going to take place and how long it would be and that I would be able to, to be without pain any longer. And I really was kind of skeptical about it because I didn't think that was possible. I was on a cane, couldn't do anything. I felt like half of a man. When you can't do anything, you're used to doing everything. It was hard to deal with. And this man was telling me he was going to give me back my life. And I'm real thankful for that. If you are considering spine surgery to relieve chronic pain, the Bonatti spine procedures are targeted outpatient procedures, unlike anything else in the market. L1 through 5 and S1 was what was ruptured and, and injured, and it was pinching the nerves. He explained to me that the way that they were going to fix that was they were going to take a laser and trimming that off so the nerve would not hit any longer uh, and therefore I wouldn't have the pain. I remember uh, sitting in a chair waiting on the uh, sedatives to work and then going to the table and hardly being able to, to lay down on the table because I had the pain. But I also remember getting off the table with no pain. I didn't still understand how this was possible, that he could just make such a small incision and, and this would cure the, the pain, but it did. And after I got off the table, uh, I sat down in a chair and they gave me some soda or, or a drink of some sort and I needed to go to uh, a motel that was right next door to the Institute and rest. And I had a drainage bag on my back and he said he would see me the next day. I felt so good, I took my wife to Tarpon Springs and walked the, the docks 
at Tarpon Spring and took her to dinner, something that I wasn't able to do for so long. Since his procedure, Don has picked up right where he left off before the pain, working hard and managing his businesses. He's also completed several personal projects like constructing a deck at his home, refurbishing a salvage pool, and restoring a 1979 Volkswagen bus named Benny. Well, my wife had to slow me down because I, I was back on my feet again, and I felt like I could do anything. And the doctor had told me not to, to pick up anything over 20 pounds. About everything that I deal with, over 20 pounds, except for the barber shop. But I was real lucky that I could go back and do the things I wanted to do. Soon after the operation, I didn't have any more pain, so it's kind of hard to take instructions, even from the doctor, not to do things that you feel so good to do. So I started immediately doing all those things and I have never looked back since. In fact, within a month of his visit to Benati, Don went with his son on a vacation that he'll never forget. I had not been able to travel for quite a, a long time because uh, sitting in an airplane or sitting in a car was just not acceptable anymore. I couldn't ride more than uh, 20 minutes without having to get out and somebody would have to help me out of my car. But after the operation, I took a, a flight to Denver, Colorado with my son and my son drove the truck and we went up into the mountains and we went white water rafting, which was really cool. And I think the rapids were fours, which were pretty strong rapids. We zip lined around the mountains on a zip line. Uh, me being the oldest man, the four firemen were on the tower at the zip line and my son, all of them didn't want to take off. And I was the first one off the tower to, to zip line. And uh, so they followed the old man after that, I guess. But we all had a good time, and that was a pretty cool experience, knowing that I could do the things that I used to do when I was younger without the pain. Bonatti was the one that helped me completely. Thank you for giving my career back to me. He said, don't tell me, I'm gonna tell you what's wrong with you and tell me if I'm correct. And so he did. The good news this time is it was not open back surgery. They did give me my life back. This car is this big. He was a doctor that didn't want to fillet my back open like a fish. He's not really cutting muscles, he's just pushing them away. Immediately after the procedure, I was able to stand straight again and I had zero pain. Well, he did the surgery on the left side, and a week later, I was back in the gym. Don't wait until you're on that downward slide where you can't even function anymore. Just don't wait, just get it done. When somebody can help you to where you can recover and where you can do the things that you were able to do before, you just become thankful. I can't thank the Bonatti Institute enough for giving me my life back. It just opens up doors that you thought were closed. I love you, Doc. <laughs>
that they are going to compromise the canals where the nerves are located, and they are going to develop problems. And one of the problems is going to be first pains, and they can go farther with numbness, they can go farther with weakness, and they can end in paralysis. Let me interject here because we talk about the failure rate of fusions and it's over 50%. In a one level fusion, it's staggering. It's 65% failure of a one level fusion. Now, we talk to patients all the time that have had multiple fusions. That failure rate explodes to 85%. Now, and failure. just to interject myself, why? does it fail so much? I know we talk about it all the time, but why do those types of surgeries fail so often? Well, it's just common sense. If Which you, I lack, so. If you, no, no, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm, joking. I'm just saying it's common sense when you look at the, the, the anatomy. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a segment that's supposed to have a space to allow motion, mm -hmm. if you remove that motion, that motion needs to be compensated in some place. So spread it to the next segment or into below segment right. into the above segment. That is the cause of the failure. Mm -hmm. that, and the, what is amazing is that the industry keep pushing fusions. Mm -hmm. And if you look at all the medical journals, they are practical medical journals. They are written mm -hmm. or they are um, protected by experimentations or by instruments that they are being done at the universities, mm -hmm. and then they are going past those ones to the industry, and the industry is pushing this. But the problem that I see here is they are pushing a bad surgery. Why are they pushing in it a so medical, hard though? In, in, a, in, a, in a population, mm -hmm. and the results are so pathetic. And because it's amazing it's to see that they, they don't, they don't, start to wise up and the doctors start to say, this is not the way to treat mm -hmm. the, the, the spine. Right. That is why we are so successful, because we do not ever practice a fusion. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Benatti, some of these instruments that are being put <clears throat> into people, these screws, plates, rods, they're getting mangled and tangled in the patient's nerves. Some of the problem is to be able to put the screw you need mm -hmm. to have really uh, some sort of a accurate vision mm -hmm. of where that screw is going to go. Right. And then when you do that, uh, you're using x-rays. Not everybody is anatomically the same. perfect. Correct. So when you, when you use a screw, uh, the patient can have a small little rotation yeah. on, the, on, the, on, the, on the vertebra mm -hmm. or a little bit of a deformity because it's an overgrowth of the facet mm -hmm. and the pedicle is not right in the right place. Right. Some of these screws go directly on nerves. And it's horrible. We see the results consistently at the Benatti Spine Institute of people that are suffering with those things. Now, traditionally, somebody comes in, they have a fusion, there's problems above and below. What do traditional doctors do? Unfortunately, they go and diffuse above and below. So they the extend chain the fusion. And then the, the, the problem with that is now they create in other segment that is going to fall apart. Or the patient is going to look like a turtle. He's not right. going to be able to move the back. So that's enough to produce now pressure points on the, on the fixation. Mm -hmm. And when the fixation starts to be under pressure, the, the, the screws are going to get loose. Mm -hmm. And once the screws get loose, now you have a separation between the bone mm -hmm. and the screw, and in between becomes a collagen that is the scar tissue. Right. That material that is mm -hmm. there separating from the screw mm -hmm. and the bone, now that, that element there has nerves and has vessels. Right. So every time that you move, you have a horrible pain. Doc, back to Ethan's question. We've been talking about fusions for years, and I have a sneaking suspicion. We know that these procedures don't work. It seems like they're just generated by the amount of billing that they create for these facilities. Are they very, very expensive to perform? Mm, well, good point. It, is, it is profitable f on, on all, the, all the different uh, um, components. It's profitable because the individual at the university who develop a special tool, because it's amazing to see when you look at those, those magazines, Every day in a magazine is a new different type of a gadget invented mm -hmm. by 
whatever the university, whatever the teacher at the university, or whatever the, the doctor that is working on that, that is a tremendous amount of different type of, a, of a instrumentation that you use for. And those instruments mm -hmm. are so radically made specific for that, that when you need to take those screws and those plates, you need to have the instruments specifically to remove that one. Right. What is in other type of a, I'm not gonna say fraud, but I'm gonna say that this impose expenses on a mm -hmm. procedure that is a bad procedure, had bad results, had totally, totally mangled them, the, the population of patients. Yeah. And at the same time, they keep advertising and they keep pushing mm -hmm. fusions. You gotta believe when you go to a medical meeting and you look the things that they are doing, you, I, I mean, I get petrified because they are taking, in some of the cases, they are taking the whole bone, yeah, the whole vertebra, and doing what they call a corpectomy, and then they are putting a replacement of a material there. Mm -hmm. That is that is totally inhumane. And at the same time, the results are horrendous. It's like a doctor that has no idea the mechanics of the body, and they're changing the mechanics of the body, and it makes it uh, fall apart because they're, they're adding too many things that shouldn't be in the body there. They're creating uh, non-motion where there's supposed to be motion, and there's no regard for the patient and and how their lives are going to be affected but by the, these things. But the worst part of it is they know. They know that these results are terrible. Right, and so they don't care. I, I, don't, I don't understand why they continue with. Yeah. And, and First, do no harm. No, That's and the, what and doctors the, and the are supposed thing that we're, to live by. The other thing that we're forgetting here mm -hmm. is they keep coming with new ideas. And the right. new idea that's coming in the market now that already failed in Europe right. is... Interbody inter fusion mm -hmm. using a dish replacement. Sure. And then you go, oh my God, this is in other problem. The major problem is some of this fusion, some mm -hmm. of the things that are being placed there, you cannot take it out. Wow. Mm. That's a shame. But more often than not, the Bonatti spine procedures can help somebody that's suffering in pain. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Brittany. We'll have you back on another yeah, time. Yeah, we've got a lot more questions, so we'll get to them an, another day. Part, really appreciate it. Yes. 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 That's what we'll do. And we'll cover more of these questions in a future episode. Thanks for watching American Medicine today. If you have any comments or questions, contact us at the number below. You can tweet at Dr. Benatti using hashtag American Medicine Today or hashtag AMT. We would like to hear from you. The preceding program was a paid presentation for American Medicine Today. The information and opinions expressed are solely those of American Medicine Today and are not the opinions of the station, its affiliates, management, or employees.